one of the, the images, but it's going to be plus one image. So it, I, I was thinking it's going to just have a kind of conversation. Okay. Yeah, so it's nothing, nothing in, in essence, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we can start here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Historical Research at Polish Academy of Sciences in Berlin. Uh, my name is Milena Hirsmash Koch, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third seminar of Klaus Zedner Colloquium Series entitled uh, Museums, Collections, and the Art Market Enhanced Perspectives. Uh, I'm extremely pleased to welcome our splendid guests, Dr. Magdalena Dublewska from the Artists and Faculty, uh, Faculty of the uh, University of Warsaw, and Dr. Margareta von Oswald um, from the uh, Center. It's a long name, so excuse me for it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so, as long as ours. And uh, at the same um, from the Center for Anthropological Research for Museums and Heritage, uh, shortly Karma, yes, at Humboldt uh, University in Berlin. Uh, so, um, if I may, I will introduce briefly our our uh, speakers. So, Dr. Magdalena Wrublewska will present her paper um, today evening. Uh, is an art historian and uh, an assistant professor at the Menschen Faculty uh, of Artes Liberales from 2015 to 2020. She was responsible for research activities in the Museum of Warsaw, where she co-created a new uh, main uh, permanent exhibition entitled The Things of Warsaw. She has received several fellowships, uh, for example, from uh, Louvain, the Centre for, for Photography at the Catholic University of Louvain, yes, in my parents' right, um, Kunsthistorisches Institut in Florence, Max Flag Institute, and Staatliche Museen zu Berlin. She also received a fellowship of the Ruskin Library at the Lancaster University, Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. Um, Magdalena was also awarded a research grant from the National Science Center in Poland in 2012 and a prize of the Polish Art Historians Association for her PhD dissertation on the genesis of a photographic reproduction of artwork. Am I right? The book, your PhD thesis, was published recently this year, yes? Congratulations uh, on, on that. Uh, from 2018 and 2021, she has been an investigator in the research project European Colonial Heritage Modalities in Entangled Cities. This was Horizon Program 2020 in a work package about the museum's colonial pasts. Magdalena is an author of numerous publications on photography, uh, for example, Photographs of Ruins, Ruins of Photographs, 19. 44, 2014, she also published on colonialism and decolonialization in the context of art and museums. Yeah, Magdalena, we are extremely happy to have you here tonight. And um, the pleasure is um, not less to have Margareta with us. And she's a social cultural anthropologist and curator. Her research is uh, concerned with museums and difficult heritage, asking how museums can be truly democratic places that affect change. She's currently the curator uh, research fellow of Mindscapes, the Wellcome Trust International Cultural Program, excuse me, which aims to support a transformation in how we understand, address, and talk about mental health. In her recently published book entitled Working Through uh, colonial collections and ethnography of the an ethnography of the ethnological museum in Berlin. She discusses the possibilities and limits of engaging with colonialism in ethnological museums. Other recent open access publications that she both edited with Jonas Tinius are awkward archives, ethnographic drafts for a modular curriculum, 
um, published in 2022, and across anthropology, traveling colonial legacies, museums, and the curatorial published in 2020. Uh, and Margareta is going to deliver a comment on, on uh, Magdalena's paper. Uh, so thank you once again for, for accepting our invitation. Um, and um, we are delighted to have this discussion uh, today evening. Uh, we are having, as I mentioned uh, today, our third seminar. Uh, so uh, we are continuing with, with our reflections on social cultural uh, significance of collections and museums in the postmodern perspective. And this is our, as I said, third seminar, and this is also our midpoint of, of this year's series. So if I may, I'd like to make a little roundup what we were already talking about uh, during the first seminar. Um, we were talking uh, about Berlin women collectors of Jewish origin. So uh, we were discussing the um, problem and the issue of uh, collecting as a means of emancipation uh, of, uh, of individuals uh, excluded in a, let's say, double way, double manner because of their uh, gender and uh, simultaneously because of their ethnic origin. Then the second seminar was on Wilhelm Border. Uh, we focused on the biography of this prominent Berlin uh, museum scene and art market on the turn of 20th century. And while having a closer look at uh, Wilhelm Border's biography, we were also prompted by the um, on, on the importance of museums in the 19th century, and of course this uh, imperial aspect, the the cultural policy of Prussia and and in general Western uh, countries, and and the role of museums in this cultural policy and imperial politics. So. Um, I would say that uh, while while thinking uh, on the lineup of this year's seminars, we were trying to design it in this way that those seminars are somehow overlapping thematically. We can address some issues which were mentioned before and come to them again and maybe proceed a more in-depth analyze uh, during each next session and then seminar. Uh, right, so. <clears throat> Today's topic is Colonial Entanglements of Central Eastern European Museums, the case study of African collection in the National Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw. Um, although I must admit, sometimes an expression entanglement is, is even overused in, in contemporary uh, humanities, uh, I think it fits really well to the topic uh, which is referring to Polish context, as Poland's history. Um, with with the, with this uh, chapter, long chapter, lasting the whole nineteenth century of lost independence and Poland being at the same time a uh, victim and also um, also the, the the let's say the the oppressor um, trying to subordinate the, the neighboring lands, but also suffering from sort of um, colonial or imperial um, tendencies from Germany, Germany, Austin, and try those attempts of of, of um, accessing and and um, take over those 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 uh, lands of Central Eastern Europe. And at the same from the other side, the um, Poland was and Central Europe was exposed to Russian imperialism, which is, I think, also a topic which is uh, which we could continue uh, in terms and reference to nowadays situation. Uh, right. So, uh, without any further prolongation from my side, I would like to just make briefly some organizational. Remarks. So first, we would like to ask Magdalena to give her, to present her paper, followed by Margareta's uh, short comment, and then we will um, then ask also Magdalena to address Margareta's questions, remarks, and then finally we will open the discussion. So you are all most welcome to ask questions to those of you who are watching us uh, via Zoom. You can 
type your questions in uh, the Q and A section. Um, so that's all from my side. I'm really looking forward to hearing to your presentation and your discussion. So, Magdalena, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation for having me here. Uh, I'm very excited to present uh, some first ideas of my uh, of my new research that I started some months ago in the National Ethnographic Museum uh, in Warsaw. It was a follow up of the project uh, that you were actually talking about, uh, European colonial modalities in entangled cities, where I was involved in the work package. Uh, okay, let's check. Okay. Yeah, the basic information about the project where I was involved in the work package analyzing city museums and their colonial pasts. One of the outcomes of this project was a book designed as a guide for museum theoreticians and practitioners. Here is the book uh, available in, in open access, but also a wider audience presenting different decolonial practices and approaches in uh, ethnographic, historic art, and other kinds of museums, with examples from different regions and cultural contexts. Uh, my co-author, Chila Ariese, and I have decided to include examples from Central and Eastern Europe, like Poland and Hungary, as during this ECHOS project, um, new knowledge about colonial entanglements of these regions' museums uh, was collected. Uh, even though different and less obvious than in the case of Western uh, empires, colonial involvements in this region had a significant impact on art and cultural practices. Therefore, I decided to use this uh, term entanglements to emphasize that this is something different than direct involvement or, um, uh, or engagement. So in my paper today, I would like to focus on the new permanent exhibition of Asian and African collections that was opened just before the pandemic in 2020. During my first visit, one group of objects attracted my attention immediately. There were uh, Benin, I'm sorry, Benin bronzes uh, that were never on display in this museum uh, before. Brief investigation revealed that museum uh, acquired this collection of 28 bronzes in 2017 from a family of Ryszard Boyarski, a Polish collector and geologist who used to work in Nigeria in the 1970s and 80s. At first, I was a bit surprised, startled, that uh, in the time of the heated debate about banning bronzes and declared or actual restitutions from several European countries, the Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw decided to acquire a group of them. Then I thought about the relatively little knowledge and awareness of colonial entanglements of CE countries in Poland, also among museum or perhaps especially among museum curators. But the answer to the question of why and how these highly controversial objects entered the museum's collection in Warsaw only five years ago proved to be more complex and required some research on the Ethnographic Museum's history. So uh, the Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw was founded in 1888, when this type of museum expanded across the Europe and North America, as ethnography developed as an autonomous discipline in academia, and European colonialism reached its peak. During the long 19th century, Warsaw was a city on the peripheries of the Russian Empire, as a consequence of Poland's partitions by neighboring countries. According to the recent publications of uh, historians, sorry, uh, 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 not only the period of Poland's partitions, but also the early modern era, as well as the time of German occupation during the Second World War, followed by Soviet domination until 1989, can be interpreted from the perspective of problems typical for colonialism and with the use of postcolonial theory and methodology. The historians have analyzed the processes of subjugation of Poland by neighboring empires on the one hand, and on the other, the Polish colonial ambitions directed mostly towards so-called Eastern borderlands, so territories of nowadays Western Ukraine and uh, Belarus. The processes that were called by a historian, uh, German historian Jürgen Zimmerer, among others, European internal colonization. So uh, the image of Polish society emerging from these complex studies on Polish past is very complicated. Poland was imitating the colonial practices of Western empires, while at the same time it was internalizing uh, and orientalizing gaze of the West. It was being subjugated to Russian and German military, 
economic, but also cultural supremacy, but on the other hand, tending to transfer its inferiority complex to the Poland's lower strata or other ethnicities, in particular, uh, Jewish people, Bel Belarusians or Ukrainians. Historians revealed that Poland was not only the victim of the neighboring empire's expansion, but also aspired to participate actively in the local and global processes of colonization. Apart from unrealized project of territorial expansion in Africa, Poland, like other CE countries, was involved indirectly in global imperial and colonial power relations that reflected in politics and economy, but also in the area of culture. It relates especially to museums and collections where many patterns and stereotypes of defining and perceiving the cultures called other exotic folk were transferred from the Western, it was mostly British and German ethnography, and from the model of imperial museum institutions supplemented with the local context like dimensions ethnic minorities. Some of these patterns and stereotypes remain unrecognized in the National Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw for their re re relatively recent post-colonial approach to Polish history has not been related to the research in the field of museology. Today, I would like to reflect on this problem, focusing on the display of the African collection that covers roughly half of the exhibition space that is titled The African Expeditions, The Asian Rose. This is the poster that uh, introduces the exhibition to the audience. The exhibition is presenting objects from two continents in wide chronological and thematic perspectives. These two parts can be visited uh, independently as they were prepared by different curators according to uh, two distinct scenarios and are visibly separated from each other in the exhibition area. So on the right, we have uh, the part that is devoted to Africa and on the left, there is a part about, uh, about Asia. As the title itself suggests, an important leitmotiv in the presentation of objects from the African collection is the expedition, a journey undertaken by travelers from Central Eastern Europe to discover unknown territories. And indeed, the first showcase at the entrance of the exhibition hall is devoted to the figure of Leopold Janikowski and his collection that was created in the 1880s during the trip to Central Africa, to Liberia, Guinea, Cameroon, with Stefan Scholz Rogozinski, a soldier of the Russian Navy and initiator of so-called First Polish Expedition to Africa. Objects that Janikowski brought from Africa to Warsaw laid the foundations for the collection of the Ethnographic Museum there, so the African exhibition opens with his legacy to commemorate the patron or founding father of the institution. During his stay at Fernando Po, an island in the Gulf of Guinea, Janikowski, who was meteorologist by profession, began amateur ethnographic research of the Bubi people, whose customs and social structure he later described in the article published in the Scientific Bulletin of the Geographical Society in Paris. The goals of the exhibition, however, were not purely scientific, and in 1882, together with Scholz Rogozinski, they established a Polish colony in Cameroon. The political context of their action was the third partition of Poland, which resulted in the division of state territories between neighboring empires, Russian and Austro-Hungarian and Russian. Poland completely disappeared from the political map of Europe, and the travelers were hoping to compensate for this loss by gaining new lands in Africa. Scholz Rogozinski has written in his diary that his agenda was, I quote, establishing a second free homeland for immigrants from an oppressed country. Janikowski confirmed, uh, confirmed these goals uh, years later in his book titled In the Jungles of Africa, Bujunga Afriki in Polish, edited in 1936 by the Polish Maritime and Colonial League. When I met Rogozinski in 1880 and when he shared with me his plans for scientific research, as well as the main by necessity hidden goal of the exhibition, namely to find a suitable area for Polish colonization as a future refuge for those who were not only materially, but also spiritually too much pressured under the rule of our three partitioners, I was absolutely taken by this idea and I gave myself to it with all my soul. However, fate did not allow us to carry out this plan, end of quote. Curiosity and scientific goals were inseparable from uh, the agenda of uh, colonial ambitions in the specific context of Polish history. Colonial dreams to establish in Africa a substitute for the Polish state that would be the refuge for political distance were paradoxically made by Scholz Rogozinski and Janikowski when the territories of their own country 
have become the subject of internal European colonization, but they failed to see this analogy, of course. Their attempts were quickly interrupted by the arrival of the British and German troops in Cameroon two years later. Poles who have managed to sign, allegedly <laughs> managed to sign over 35 treaties with leaders of local communities, decided to hand over the colony to the British authorities in the hope of the future cooperation. The Germans have, however, quickly taken over the territory and established a protectorate in Cameroon. So in 1885, Szotr, and Janikowski returned to Warsaw through London and Paris, where they gave several lectures about what they called their scientific discoveries. Most of the approximately 370 objects collected by Scholz Rogiński in Cameroon, Gabon, and Fernando Po were placed in the Technical and Industrial Museum in Krakow, from where they were later transferred to the local ethnographic museum. They did not attract the attention of ethnographers for almost a century, and only in 1975 were described in the journal Ethnologia Polona as the most valuable in the collection of this museum. The objects brought by Janikowski started the collection of the Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw, established in 1888, directly after his donation. But they do not exist anymore, as, um, uh, as the museum, uh, the old collections gathered in the museum in the first half century of its existence were destroyed in World War II, uh, mainly during the bombings of Warsaw in 1939, when the museum building was heavily uh, damaged. You can see. Uh, uh, actually, this is a photo of the ruin and the reconstruction process, and here we have um, uh, the reconstruction with the view of the Palace of Culture and Science in, in the background. Uh, therefore, the objects presented today in the showcase devoted to Janikowski at the entrance to the African exhibition are analogous or similar to those brought by him from Guinea and Cameroon. They are not the same, obviously. But the viewer will not find any information about the goals of the expedition to Central Africa, its course and the circumstances of the acquisition of the objects presented to him, also about the fate of the objects and the replacement by, uh, by other objects from the museum collection. So the complex history of colonial ambitions and attempts of a country that lost independence for over 120 years remains in the museum untold. Even though it is strictly linked with its genesis, the history of its development after regaining independence in 1980 and also after World War II. Uh, all objects displayed uh, at the African exhibition today were collected after 1945, but their provenance is usually not revealed to the viewer. Only some of them were brought by travelers like Václav Korabiewicz in the 1950s or private collectors like Ryszard Boyarski in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the group of Benin Bronzes is from the collection of Boyarski. But mostly they were taken over from the post-German institutions, usually museums or university, university collections located on so-called Western borderlands of Poland, called by communist propaganda recovered lands. In the cities like Breslau, nowadays Wrocław, or Stettin, uh, Stettin today, among others. These acts of revenge, it was called uh, explicitly, uh, explicitly revenge for occupation and exploitation, war damages and loots uh, that were common. All these acts were uh, of this revenge were common at the time, but they were sanctioned by law. It was justified to take over all these collections. Uh, and they were uh, never critically interpreted in the context of post-war collecting policies uh, in Polish museums, like the Ethnographic Museum uh, in Warsaw, which has some consequences. This problem seems one of the keys to post-colonial debate in the CEE region, but the museum has chosen to highlight and celebrate the figures of travelers and collectors instead of explaining uh, complex histories of objects, of their trajectories, and the political circumstances of their acquisitions. Even though it is not expressed directly in the exhibition space, the narrative is organized around the figure of traveler. The names of travelers and collectors are recalled alongside the objects that are associated with them, and biographies of key figures are introduced in descriptions. However, in the case of Janikowski, only some parts of inconvenient stories are revealed. For instance, Václav Poradiewicz, who worked as a deputy custodian of the King George V Memorial Museum in Tanganyika, nowadays Tanzania, has contributed largely to the expansion of the collection of the Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw, and his name appears near many objects. He brought many of masks that you can see in this part of uh, installation. 
But the information that he was expelled from Hanganika in 1954, precisely because of shipping of numerous objects to the Polish People's Republic, is missing. At the same time, uh, sorry, at the time, this kind of practice was justified and explained in Poland as a form of compensation for war losses in museums and was never critically addressed by the museum staff, which has an impact on current collecting policies and practices. As an example of these practices and, uh, and policies, um, I would like to recall again uh, the group of Benin bronzes purchased by the museum in 2017 from the Richard Boyarski family with a grant donation from the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage in Poland. Even though this is a recent acquisition, the provenance was not traced and it is not known under what circumstances the Polish engineer in Nigeria took possession of these objects. Museum did not obtain, uh, obtain additional documentation related to their legal status that is now, to my knowledge, in the hands of the collector's family and that could shed new light on these objects' histories. They are buried in terms of age and function. Some of them were manufactured in the Benin Kingdom and belong to its rulers, Oba Kings, but more of them are replicas produced after the fall of the kingdom in 1897 for European art and antiquities markets. The fact that the museum has acquired replicas seems meaningful in terms of the understanding of the object value and the ambition to be equal to the Western museums, but the visitor is not aware of this, as all objects are, are labeled as made in the Benin Kingdom. There is also no information about the history of Benin bronzes, the general history um, and the ethical problems that are related to this history and current debate regarding their institutions, not to mention the position of the museum in this matter. The only information put on display refers to the Polish engineer working in Nigeria who had a passion for this type of objects. Taking into account the general deficiency of information in the exhibition area, the selection of provided facts is highly significant. African exhibition in the National Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw is built upon a myth of Polish-African relationships during the 19th and 20th centuries, which were allegedly not marked by violence, as the travelers were not coming with troops of soldiers. These relationships are characterized as friendly and partner based on good intentions of in-commerce who were only willing to help as doctors and teachers or to modernize as engineers. It replicates the popular argument recalled in post-colonial debate in Poland, repeated also in academic discourse that says that we had no colonies. The short comment to the exhibition published on the museum's website says, I quote, the nature of the presence of Jelikowski and other Poles on this continent was different from that of the other Europeans of their time. But, there, uh, but it that does not reflect on the reason for the different nature of this presence, which lies rather in the economic and political conditions of Poland than in the noble intentions of Polish travelers. This myth about the innocent, almost charity relationship of in-commerce from Poland culminates in the hologram installation that closes uh, the African exhibition. In the showcase, at the end of the room, the throne of the Bamun King is presented, or in fact, a copy of the throne. The original is in Humboldt uh, form in Berlin. It was given uh, to the museum during the diplomatic visit of the Cameroon representative to the Polish People's uh, Republic in 1973, after the official establishment of cooperation between two countries. When a visitor comes closer and press the interactive screen, the king uh, hologram appears and starts speaking to him. The king is played by a Polish speaking actor that recites uh, texts written by the curator uh, of the exhibition, but the viewer might be confused as this information again is not shared with him. Some of the texts the actor reads provide information about the Bamun kingdom and Cameroon nowadays, but only if the visitor touches the right icon on the screen. The text that is spoken at the very beginning, before the selection of, of the text, explains to the visitor the good relations between Poland and Cameroon with a strong focus on well-known positive stories about teachers, doctors, and engineers coming to Africa. The exhibition was funded with EU grants and the project's sustainability or durability uh, goes until 2030, so it does not allow major changes. Nevertheless, the new director of the museum, who was not responsible uh, for this project, has decided to introduce possible modification. And we have 
started the discussion about the introduction of the colonial perspective into the exhibition. But before the changes are made, a museum should recognize its historical and contemporary colonial entanglements and acknowledge colonial continuities in its material structures like collections, exhibitions that are presented to the public, as well as practices and activities, acquisitions, educations, uh, education activities, uh, publishing, etc. So this requires systematic research on the museum's history and the provenance of its collections to identify the impact of multiple re regimes of the institution, like Russian Empire, German occupation during Second World War, later Cold War Soviet, uh, Soviet policies. And uh, these notions such as European internal colonization or the other multiple colonialism by John Oldfield could shed new light on the history's interpretation. So there is also the methodological framework that should be developed to address these uh, histories and entanglements, colonial entanglements uh, properly. Uh, this new methodological framework should address the specific mixture of an inferiority complex with a strong sense of superiority that I call the Polish colonial complex. It reflects the duality of the colonial situation in Poland. It was an object of the subjugation of neighboring empires while at the same time having the ambition, but also a long history when we think about uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and also Lithuania of colonizing practices in this region. The construction of the colonial innocence myth, uh, which was recently addressed by Matthew Rampley regarding Czech art and culture, is one of the main challenges in the colonial project for museology uh, in Poland, and without that, any change uh, in the museum space, in the museum exhibition, will be just uh, illusionary. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Marvella, for this brilliant paper. I think very many interesting uh, problems are already arising. Uh, now we better have uh, Margareta going to deliver a comment. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm really um, excited and happy to talk to you and to um, to explore some questions that I'm personally um, thinking about these days, and but also obviously responding to um, to what you've just presented to us. Um, First of all, I was also, um, yeah, I was really happy also to, to talk to you today because I, I, when we saw each other again, actually we saw each other again today. So we've met about 10 years ago when I just started my PhD and um, I was really giving my very, very first presentation um, in Florence where, um, where Magdalena was also presenting. So I'm really grateful to, to be able to exchange again after 10 years of really <laughs> changing places to all over Europe um, and elsewhere. So I'm um, really grateful about that. And then um, I think I'm the only one here on the on the panel who's not a historian. So I'm an anthropologist. So I'm mainly going to focus on current, current practices, basically. That's also what I have been most concerned with and specifically curatorial practice. But I know that you're really engaged with that question as well, because um, I recently had the pleasure to read your book, The Guide on um, Decolonial Practices, and I'm also going to refer to that right now, because I kind of want you to explore that in relation to your case study right now. So the first, I have kind of three points that I want to talk about. So the first one is this, the linking of your work, um, the, the, the um, what you just presented and the um, and your book on decolonial practices and your kind of overview of what's happening in different places in Europe. That's kind of one point I want to address. Then I'm really interested in the question of curatorial responsibilities and what there is to do in the field of, of um, ethnographic museums these days in particular with regards to exhibitions. So that's one other point that I'm going to focus on. And then the one that I wanted to start with is the history of collections. And um, what really struck me is that you, when you talk about the history of the collections that you've been dealing with is that basically everything is basically post-war collections, which is obviously not the same in German museums, um, because especially when, we, when it comes to Africa, most of the collections stem from German colonial times. Um, so more than 50% of the collections were basically collected during that time. 
However, the post-war histories are also really interesting, or actually the pre-war and war um, histories of these collections. Um, because in Berlin, for example, what I found extremely fascinating when I started to work on them, which is a history I had really never heard of before, is that um, when the Germans prepared them for the war, they kind of um, placed collections, all kinds of museums collections all over Germany, mainly in castles, um, within museum storages, but really all over the place. And very difficult to follow until today where they actually were. But also um, some of the collections were obviously taken as war booty um, during the war. And with regards to the Africa collection of Berlin, what happened is that they were taken, some of the objects were taken as Soviet war booty to Leningrad during, um, during the socialist times that they were given to Leipzig as a diplomatic gift were hidden for several decades within in Leipzig storages, so Leipzig Glasgow Museum. And then were given back to the Berlin Ethnological Museum in 1990. So basically, and obviously during this entire process, there were lots of losses mm -hmm. of collections. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering if you could come back a little bit to that point about how this collection that you worked on came together, and in particular with regards to that question of um, um, what I, I forgot the term that you used, but the revenge. Uh, yeah, um, the revenge for the losses. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could explain a bit further how collections traveled within Poland, maybe as well, mm -hmm. and how how that collection that you've been now working on came together. So that's the first point I'm really interested in, because yeah, that that's um, something that also really so many of those objects are not um, until today um, even countable because they, we don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's just so interesting also when you think about the logistics of the moving of those collections. So um, it was really like, especially when you think about the fact that from Leningrad they were moved to Leipzig, there was, this was all a secret maneuver and it was 15,000 just Africa collection objects. So it was huge amounts. It was really trucks and trucks and trucks of objects being in the night like brought to life. So, so there, there's all these kind of fascinating stories behind it. Um, so the second point that I'm um, really interested in that you kind of touched upon as well and that I would be more interested in exploring and also how you personally want to kind of research that because I, I didn't know that this was your new research project but it, that it's great that it's just started to kind of see also how you want to go about it. Um, so what I'm really interested in is, is the question of curatorial responsibilities and authorship. Mm -hmm. So when you, I don't know if you've all been to the Humboldt Forum in, in, in Berlin, What's really interesting with regards to the ethnological collections in that place is that basically you see that there are very, very different authorships in place. There are very different kinds of exhibitions happening that feel really that they even have different temporalities. So some of them, I mean, everything opened um, after 2020, so they're all really recent, but some of them already feel quite old. Others um, have opened last year only. Um, and you feel that there's a difference in basically everything that they, there's different kinds of labels, there's different kinds. So, and then you don't know who's actually responsible for them. And very often when you talk to curators, they say, yeah, but these plans have, are really old. So I've just followed up from someone. So it's not, it's not my, it's not mine. I don't want to be responsible for it. And, um, and I was just wondering how, how you go along with that question with this exhibition, because I also heard that there's a new director who wants to add modifications. There will be different kinds of stories that will also be integrated in that exhibition, how, how um, people are dealing with it on the ground. And a more general question I would like to address to you with, with regards to curatorship is what kind of role you think in general they could, should take. Because if you look at the history of, of curators in ethnological collections, mm -hmm. when they started, it was really very much about research. So trying to also do field work, what kind of, also with regard to the education you needed, you need to be an anthropologist in order to work in these collections, you need to have done field work in the area you were responsible for in order to then be responsible for those collections, to care for them, to, to enlarge the collection. Mm -hmm. But then I feel that it has more and more shifted towards just making exhibitions. So really just being much more responsible for curating and doing discourse and the display around it. And I'm currently wondering 
what is the what should today's role of those curators be because very often they actually can't speak for those collections anymore if you think about decolonial practices at least not by themselves mm -hmm. so what should be their role and i'm tending more and more to see them as mediators or people who are actually just there to allow other people to have access and and work with those collections be it research or be it exhibitions or be it restitution or so I'm just wondering, also with regards to your book um, on decolonial practices, what you would think a curator should actually do with those collections. Mm -hmm. um, and then my third point was with, was with regards to your book. And I just want to kind of give, briefly give you some, some insights into that book because it's really interesting. So uh, Magdalena, together with her colleague, they, um, they kind of create uh, sort of six different aims for decolonization in the museums. I'm just going to read them to you so you know what how the book is structured. So the first is creating visibility. The second is increasing inclusivity. The third is decentering. The fourth is championing empathy. The fifth is improving transparency. And the sixth one is embracing vulnerability. So some of them, as you also say in your introduction, might not kind of come to mind at first, you know, sight when you think about what the decolonization could consist of. And what I would be, what I would be really interested in is where and how you see attempts of decolonization within your case study, mm -hmm. or if there, if 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 this is something because in the way that you present it to us, it feels, and this is very often the case when you look at ethnographic exhibition making. Still, there seems to be no hope. Mm -hmm. But then, where where is the hope? And maybe it is with the new director who comes, or and then something else that if you actually don't see any hope, mm -hmm. then I'm wondering, um, which is something that I um, discussed a lot with my my colleague in the across anthropology book that I I produced with him. Is that question of that where else does it take place if it doesn't take place in the institutions of anthropology? So if it doesn't take place in the institutes and the universities and the museums, where is the discourse happening? And so I would be really interested if in the Polish context or in, in Warsaw in particular as a city as well, where are the places where that kind of critique arises and gets forced as well? Because if you look at the German development, and when I started in 2012, my research, it was really very much coming from activist movements, mm -hmm. also from within the museum that was marginalized, but also from out there, mainly from outside, and then coming from research as well, and then coming from politics as well. And it's really just through that combination mm -hmm. of different agents and these convergences that really lots of change could happen. So I'm just wondering if you could give some insight mm -hmm. into how that's um, happening today mm -hmm. in Holland. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for introducing this book and presenting. I uh, I do remember that there were six categories, but I was not sure if I, <laughs> I have a Oh my gosh, you don't want to ask about the categories. <laughs> then I'm back. No, but um, the, the book is quite different. I said that this project is a kind of follow up of uh, uh, Deep Horizon 2020 project and the book that was produced in the end. And the book was somehow developed from the report that we were asked to write with Kila Aliese, who is also a historian and museologist. And the aim of the, this report was quite optimistic, to find some good examples of the colonial practices and also to give some academic frame, so to develop some categories that might be useful. Uh, some are obvious, like visibility, but uh, vulnerability, I do not think it's that obvious in the context even of, of museums. And, uh, these uh, very fragile, delicate uh, um, problems and issues that we are always touching when we speak about the colonial past. So that was a nice task to find uh, these good practices and to write about them. Uh, but there were also some <laughs> obstacles, like we felt too optimistic. Now, as you can see, I switched to a less optimistic example. But also, uh, we were perhaps um, somehow trapped in, uh, in this idea of a very global project. So we had to uh, develop these very general, very universal categories, 
to cover all these areas because examples are not uh, i mentioned about the examples from central eastern europe context like hungary and poland but the examples are from africa asia western europe uh, from america so it was really difficult to find a key to structure this book and that's why the categories are very universal and at some point at some level we felt uh, that this book is like only covering the surface of the problem that this is the beginning and i have decided personally to find the example that would be uh, perhaps less obvious, because when we think about, for example, uh, the history of colonial uh, colonialism in uh, in India, or we think about uh, about Congo, uh, for example, and we think about these huge museum projects uh, uh, like the colonization of uh, the museum that is now called Africa Museum, but. Uh, um, uh, but it was, of course, the colonial museum of uh, uh, King Leopold. So these are quite obvious and uh, also well known and well recognized examples and problems that uh, uh, they are addressing. And I was thinking about something less obvious and something uh, that would uh, reveal mm, mm, more complex and like multi layered perspectives uh, and I thought that uh, Central Eastern European region that is really important it is really the history of Polish colonial involvements ambitions entanglements is really well reserved by historians I would say starting from uh, the early modern era until actually nowadays even there is a discussion about uh, the war in Ukraine and we are trying to uh, think about the past and Polish attitude towards Ukraine in the context of the war, but we also think about this war uh, in uh, categories of imperial or colonial war. So it was a kind of trigger that would be response to your last question, but I feel that the war um, uh, in Ukraine was a kind of trigger for, uh, for the uh, discussion and debate. So I thought that this uh, example would allow me to, uh, uh, to show some less obvious and less known aspects of colonial practices uh, and that would be the relation between the book and the, uh, the new project. Uh, your second point was about uh, curatorial responsibilities and authorship. I visited uh, Humboldt Forum, I spent there uh, three uh, days, so I've seen almost everything, but the basement is still not visited. <laughs> Now, there was an uh, interesting exhibition, temporary exhibition about African masks on the ground floor, for example. And uh, mm, uh, yeah, my, my experience was that this is like many museums in one museum that I could find, like, uh, for example, uh, in uh, the Asian part of the exhibition. I felt like in the almost like in Dalen, like in the 19th century concept of ethnographic museum, very aesthetic concept. And then uh, in the African section, it was all uh, very much complicated, of course, because of the German uh, colonial past. But uh, for me, it was like combination between the traditional ethnographic museum. And then I was thrown into very critical, in my opinion, radical, uh, when we think about uh, not temporary, but permanent exhibition in uh, in a huge museum, European Museum, I felt that this was very radical critique, uh, not only um, a critique of German colonial past, revealing uh, all those facts and informations that uh, are not provided to the visitor uh, in Warsaw, but also um, uh, I felt that in some parts of this exhibition, there was like a meta-narrative about our contemporary uh, attitude, uh, the lacks of our knowledge, the gaps. There was an excellent part uh, explaining to the visitor that we cannot read a photograph without any information and context, and that we see uh, something that is called colonial photograph, but we, we, are, we are not aware what we are actually uh, looking at. So, um, 
yeah, I would say that Humboldt Forum was like uh, multiple museums in one huge uh, museum building, and therefore I'm not surprised that curators have a problem with uh, authorship because they do not uh, feel responsible perhaps for some parts of the exhibition. And uh, when I think about uh, the ethnographic museum in Warsaw, there is the name of curator is not provided in the exhibition area, but uh, we know who is the curator. He's actually speaking about this exhibition at uh, the other event in Warsaw today or tomorrow. Uh, and uh, his approach uh, is, of course, different uh, uh, than mine. He's not engaged in post-colonial critique, and he would rather argue that uh, we had no colonies, so this is not a colonial uh, museum. My argument would be opposite. Uh, you don't need to have this colonial history, colonial past, and direct involvement to have a purely colonial museum project in the center of the city. This is, uh, this is my argument. When I look at the museum, uh, being more interested in discovering all these patterns and stereotypes that are taken from different sources and resulting with this colonial project in the, in the very center of the city. Uh, so this is my, um, uh, my, uh, uh, my attitude. Uh, so the curator feels responsible for this uh, exhibition. He feels uh, the author of this uh, exhibition, but we do not need when we uh, speak about uh, the meaning and the impact of this um, uh, exhibition, uh, exhibition project. Uh, uh, the third point was about the history of collection, but uh, then you were also speaking about the role of the curator. So perhaps I will uh, try to elaborate a bit more uh, about this problem of curator to, <laughs> to somehow wrap it and close it. Uh, but yeah, usually uh, in the history, it was mostly about research and field work. And also uh, nowadays, curators in ethnographic museum in Warsaw are doing this uh, field work. And it is also connected with acquisition practices. So this is something I would like to learn, uh, learn more about. Uh, there was also this idea of curator, someone who takes care of is custodian of, of the collection. Today they are curating and we ask about the next step, what is next, and usually curators are trying to give um, the floor, the space, and, um, uh, and the means for the groups that might be more uh, interested or involved in the collections. Uh, uh, and. Uh, at this moment, this is not the case of the Ethnographic Museum, even though I feel that there is a little hope to uh, change this attitude, to involve um, not only curators and museum specialists, but also people from different communities who might be interested, uh, not only in research, but also different types of engagement with the collection in terms of artistic practices, but also um, uh, uh, maybe a kind of social activism. So I feel that there is uh, a chance for um, uh, for opening of uh, this collection and this museum that would be, in my opinion, um, the future role of curator to, to open up, to invite uh, and uh, to um, uh, to include those who were um, presented in the museum, but we're not really invited to uh, um, uh, to give their perspective in any need. It might be uh, a meeting, a conference, a discussion, but also exhibition project. Um, so I, I see the future of the curator, and this is what is happening in museums, also like Humboldt Forum uh, nowadays, to give a floor uh, to those who might be uh, more interested, but also more engaged uh, in collections when we think about the past, the history, but also um, um, how to explain this. Like the museum creates stereotypes. The, 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 the National Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw creates stereotypes. So I would be more interested to hear the voices of those who are affected by uh, those stereotypes too. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, uh, what I would like to say about the role of the uh, curator to open this uh, space and to, to involve and invite. 
And uh, when I think about the history of collection, it's really, uh, yeah, it's really complicated because uh, this 19th century collection has only the symbolic meaning nowadays. It was destroyed in 1939. And uh, of course, there were some plans and attempts to evacuate uh, the collections from Warsaw, from National uh, Museum in Warsaw, and also from the Ethnographic Museum elsewhere, but they were not realized. Uh, for mostly logistic reasons. I read some um, documents uh, and uh, uh, memories written by Stanislav Lorenz, who was director of the National Museum in Warsaw for more than 50 years, <laughs> and then an institution. Uh, and he was also responsible for the Royal Castle reconstruction in the 70s. And uh, it was a very complex situation because uh, being the director of the National uh, uh, National Museum uh, in Warsaw, not ethnographic, but the art museum, he was visiting authorities uh, of the city because it was a municipal museum for the war. And he was asking about uh, plans of the collections evacuation, uh, but nothing was prepared and the situation was a bit chaotic. So he decided to keep the collection in Warsaw and protect them in many other ways. So uh, in the very beginning of the war, uh, some objects from, uh, now I speak about the Art Museum, the National Museum in Warsaw, were taken uh, to Germany immediately, the most precious, like the paintings by Rembrandt and so on, but others were left. And uh, Stanislaw Florence and uh, people working in the museum curators, um, but also uh, other kinds of, uh, of people, uh, of the museum staff, uh, the people were really engaged in saving the collection in many complicated ways, like hiding them somewhere in uh, uh, the storage rooms, creating a false list of objects, a false list of objects that need to be uh, uh, conservated before uh, uh, before transportations. And this action was actually quite successful. Some of them were uh, uh, transferred, but they were traced by trusted people. And uh, the director of the National Museum, Stanisa Florence, he knew where they are uh, deposed in uh, Lower Silesia, for example. So this action was well managed, in my opinion, and well uh, coordinated. But uh, unfortunately, everything that was left in this museum was destroyed during the uh, 1944 uh, uprising. So that was the fate of this collection that until 1944 uh, uh, was kept quite uh, secure in Warsaw. The fate of National Ethnographic Museum was different. It was just uh, the September of 1935 when uh, uh, the fire just destroyed the uh, collection. So the donation of Yanikovsky from 1888 uh, today has this symbolic meaning. And to me, it's also very interesting, the problem of replacement, a copy, similar object, substitute for something. Uh, it's the case of Benin bronzes. Some of them are uh, from the Benin Kingdom period, most are copies made in uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and it's the case of Yanikovsky. This first case is devoted to him, but the objects are replacements because everything is lost and everything is gone. And what is interesting to me is to hear this story of uh, the collection, the complex story of the collection, and from where these uh, uh, replacements are actually coming from, because I suppose that some of them are taken from uh, Breslau, perhaps, or Stettin, or other uh, post-German cities, and that would be a great case. Just this one case, Leopold Lewandowski, would be a great uh, example to explain this difficult uh, history and this uh, multi-layered structure of this uh, uh, of these uh, uh, collections. So uh, this is the uh, the history of two different uh, collections that I was comparing, but it was difficult uh, for many reasons to evacuate them uh, um, shortly before the war. Uh, at least I know that Stanislav Lawrence was trying to do so in uh, July and uh, August of 1939. I saw the documents, I read his diaries, so I know the story uh, uh, this story really, really uh, well. And um, your last point was about uh, the attempt to decolonize where do I see it, uh, or in whom the director I've mentioned. 
uh, Robert Zidel is really open to new ideas. And when you ask where these decolonization uh, um, attempts are taking place also in this museum, but uh, rather in temporary exhibitions that are planned, uh, in some research activities, I had access to the collection and uh, to inventory, for example. So um, I feel free <laughs> to discover all these documents and uh, unconvenient facts. Uh, and also uh, there are meetings with authors of books. My Gila's book was presented there to the uh, wider audience and I had uh, an exchange with curator of African uh, exhibition, but also there was a book um, that was edited, uh, edited recently about Polish uh, racism toward uh, Roma people that was actually called the, the last socially acceptable somehow uh, form of racism uh, in, in Poland. And this uh, discussion also took place in, uh, in the ethnographic museum in Warsaw. So, I feel that uh, this force for change comes from um, mostly academic backgrounds. Some people I would call social activists, some are artists, but I would say that's, that this discussion now takes place mostly in academia in Poland and in Warsaw. But we have also interesting uh, artistic practices uh, like Magorzata Mirbetas was presented at the Venice Biennale. Uh, uh, with um, her artistic project that was actually engaging Roma uh, community. So that was very symbolic uh, to me that uh, the pavilion was uh, uh, given to uh, the artists, but also the Roma community to present uh, their art. And um, yeah, I would say that this is mostly the academic and also artistic discourse uh, where, where this change uh, has started recently. And I feel that uh, museologists in Poland, uh, like in last year, maybe last years, it was somehow in, uh, the effect of the conference that was closing our ECOS uh, project. Mm -hmm. The conference was about the museums and collections in Central, uh, uh, Eastern Central European countries in uh, uh, in this decolonial perspective, so it was somehow, I feel, uh, triggering. It, it was, yeah, the impulse that uh, uh, that is somehow present in many museums in, uh, in Poland today. So this is something that I would say has just started in, in Poland in terms of museology, in uh, research, uh, in history. There is, I think, uh, this problem is... Uh, uh, is recognized and described quite well. In the field of ethnography, this is also, uh, I think, important debate, but it was uh, the debate that took place some years ago and rather about the Western colonial practices. Maybe recently it's more, again, about uh, Poland and Central Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, uh, my response to your comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting and so many, um, so many interesting aspects like um, trajectories of objects and also mention uh, Stanislaw Lawrence. Uh, it's called in the Polish Monument Man. Were you one of the one of the? We have the colonized humans. Yes, yes, I know. We have to colonize everything. <laughs> But me and uh, Monika Stowiecka, my colleague from the Faculty of Artists Liberals, and I have um, uh, have written uh, an article quite substantial about Stanislaw Lawrence and the Na National Museum in Warsaw from the colonial uh, perspective. So mm -hmm. uh, I hope it will be edited in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah. So it's a very interesting biography. I think also. Uh, when we are already talking about entanglements, he was also so um, interesting in terms of his political engagement and uh, hidden, let's say, um, possibilities. He was really like um, uh, moving from the pre-war political situation and then uh, surviving the war in, in those difficult circumstances. So 
um, and saving the National Museum and the collection and, and all this effort. And then also, as you mentioned, it was 50 years for, for more, I think, or around 50 years, the, the director of the most important uh, museum, I think, in Poland, which was like a trezor and, and saving all, all this uh, Polish art. And then after, after 1945, also doing those excursions, as you mentioned, to uh, Lower Silesia, and then bringing uh, art, which is also somehow questionable, and all those problems are arising. So this is another topic. All right. So um, I would like to open up the discussion. And if there are any questions, um you're most welcome to 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 ask uh, our main speaker and also maybe Margareta. So please go ahead. Yes, of course. Here's the microphone just in case. Yeah, it's yeah. Yes, uh, hello, and um, thank you very much for your lecture and for your commentary. Uh, both were very interesting, very bringing lots of thought. My name is Hannah Ludwig, I'm a museologist from Ukraine, and I'm working here as well um, in some aspect of the issue of the colonizing museums in Western Europe and uh, the comparison of the processes, uh, processes which are taken or probably will take place uh, uh, in the sphere of decolonizing non European collections in Ukraine in the future, because these issues, as um, Magdalena has uh, said, um, uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, war in which the Russian triggered this decoloniality and decolonization um, agenda in Poland and also in Ukraine too. And in Ukraine, it took uh, its uh, specific and classification, diversification, the mm -hmm. Sovietization uh, trend. But I also think that it's time to start you know, like more global. Uh, um, discussion on decolonization because, to my mind, many of these are very, very white. And this white gaze that was borrowed, that was um, adopted, I sometimes uh, like <laughs> is a term I'm tempted to, to say it's like second hand orientalism because it was not. And Orientalism uh, grounded into the historical past of Ukraine, like in some aspect, it's like in Poland, too, as you um, show has shown us in this example of Asnoga, as a very striking example. It, it looked to me as if the museum reopened in 2020, just woke up absolutely innocent. Mm -hmm. of the discussion around the new bronzes and uh, decolonial uh, issues uh, which were uh, getting more and more intense in Europe and not only in Europe but also triggered from the so-called global south so powerful powerfully that it, it, it's really strange and uh, this kind of um, I would say manipulation uh, replacing Yanikovsky like a good positive, you know, um, uh, collector mm -hmm. traveler today. And uh, in, in case one, he wasn't actually the collector of this collection, which is exposed. So it's a specific um, intended manipulation in order to show this positive figure, you know. Mm -hmm. Today, it looks really strange. Mm -hmm. looks really... And uh, I wonder, uh, what do you think, how it uh, could that happen uh, in the museum in Warsaw? Um, being so innocent, or what? Or is this uh, like um, colonial complex, which you were talking about, and which I am also very interested in? 
uh, hearing more about. If this much longer complex to hybrid, so multi phase, 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 mm -hmm. let's see. Uh, is it the actual reason and the, the, the root and the assumption for this uh, gear manipulation with uh, Yanikov scheme and also with? <clears throat> Uh, with this acquisition of the neurons again, which it looks like absolutely innocent gesture, mm -hmm. very strange, very strange. Thank you. 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 Very, very uh, interesting uh, voices. And uh, my name is Wolfgang Dresdner, a historian, simple historian, and not out at a historian. So, uh, before I'm going to touch on sad issues you we were talking uh, about, uh, first, from my point of view uh, as a historian. So, uh, first of all, um, uh, I'd like to uh, draw your uh, attention uh, that uh, the debate uh, on the role of Poland uh, in and the Polish uh, colonial uh, past uh, started uh, only recently uh, in Poland. So 2006, uh, I experienced actually the first uh, debate uh, at Warsaw at University uh, in the Department of Arts and Arts at the University of Nancy. But uh, it was uh, oh, uh, actually uh, but, you know, in a very small circle of uh, historians uh, involved uh, in the uh, Asian uh, and African uh, the studies, uh, and uh, actually it has no uh, impact uh, on the uh, broader uh, audience. And actually, this uh, the debate more seriously started with the book uh, authored by. A sociologist, not a historian, but a sociologist from Evergarden, uh, the Yan Sola, he published 2011 uh, uh, a book uh, called Not a Lot of the Ruler. Uh, and he uh, actually used the pattern of post colonial analysis uh, to uh, decipher from uh, this uh, angle uh, the Polish uh, history. Uh, beginning from the medieval uh, period to the, uh, the modern uh, period uh, until the, uh, the 19th century. His uh, book, uh, to some extent, was um, uh, inspired by a French historian, Daniel Fouvois, who already in the early 1980s published uh, his uh, fantastic uh, book on the uh, Polish aristocrats in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the, the book was uh, called the Ukrainian Triangle, in which he uh, actually shown uh, this split role of the Polish uh, people or uh, the Polish upper uh, the class uh, in uh, the Ukraine as oppressors on the one hand to the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, peasants, and on the other hand as uh, the, uh, victims of the imperial Russian uh, policy. And only in the middle of the 2015, uh, I guess, after Olga Tokarczuk gave a very interesting uh, interview going back to Daniel Bogwas and Jan Vasovas about the Polish responsibility toward uh, the Ukrainians, Belarusians for their uh, colonial uh, policies, especially uh, in the 19th century, a more serious debate about the Polish colonialism uh, uh, in, 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 in the past, uh, past started uh, in Poland. So I think that this is quite important to see what is being debated now uh, in relation to the museums uh, in this broader uh, context of uh, more uh, serious and very, very heated, very emotional, uh, actually, uh, debate which started in the middle of uh, 2015. Now, uh, two questions. Uh, 
well, which I don't admit beyond what you are talking about, and which I don't uh, more to uh, the West European uh, museums. So, in order to get a serious post colonial debate, uh, we need to have both sides. So, we need to have, well, European uh, other side, which was involved uh, in the colonials, but we need to have the reactions of the other aspects. So, on the side of the former owners, the objects of other art, which uh, are shown uh, in the European uh, the museums. So, my question is. is there are there any reactions, any voices um, uh, from uh, uh, Canada, uh, as far as this, these uh, objects of uh, art, which are uh, shown on uh, in wars of our concern? And uh, because this is obvious that uh, if you, you're, you're the West, you're, you're experiencing uh, the demands the of your journey, uh, the objects of uh, art for many, many. And we say senior already as examples of her is first of the Many, many examples you can make a whole list of here. But also just looking at the recent developments, the museums, uh, ethnographic museums as well, are turning more into political stages. And let me uh, remind you uh, of a scandal uh, which uh, was caused by staging a red in uh, for the release of Egypt's political prisoners. Uh, it happened in October 2022, just before the opening of the exhibition here Reefs, unlocking ancient uh, Egypt. Which was sponsored by uh, British Petroleum BP and uh, some uh, pro environmental uh, activists gathered uh, 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 and combined the pro environmental agenda with demands of uh, releasing from uh, the, the prison uh, in uh, Egypt, uh, Ala Ab El Makar, uh, 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 Egyptian. A public and intellectual was involved in the events of 2011 uh, uh, revolution uh, in the uh, So, my question uh, is more about your approach to this politicization of the museums nowadays uh, and uh, taking uh, Mm, uh, the objects of, of art shown in the ethnographic museums, but also in art museums, in the uh, galleries, uh, the, you know, as an uh, important argument uh, in the political debates, in the political uh, debate. And now talking about the other uh, side. Uh, okay, trying to uh, implement uh, our political correct approach uh, to uh, such countries as uh, Egypt, uh, uh, for example. Sometimes we are confronted with we are confronted with, uh, with very difficult situations, and we experienced just a few days ago uh, such a situation. And uh, so here I'm referring to the uh, user to, to the uh, exhibition uh, at the National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden and uh, the museum uh, and the um, exhibition uh, which uh, was on the music uh, on the inspiration uh, of the uh, Egyptian uh, the music and uh, the ancient Egyptian uh, history for the pop scene or pop uh, music. Uh, but now this one, on the Egyptian uh, side, we heard uh, voices uh, about Afrocentric uh, approach of the authors of this uh, exhibition, criticizing of this Afrocentric. Uh, approach uh, 
voices criticizing uh referring to another very very interesting uh, very interesting uh phenomenon that uh, the talk about the culture referring to the uh Netflix docu drama uh depicting Queen Cleopatra as a black African uh and they also decided to debate about the classification of the history and uh, uh, and uh, uh, saying that uh, actually Cleopatra and Hellenistic Greek features. So sometimes we were in a very tricky uh, situation, just confronting such voices and trying to understand, in my opinion, justified demands on the other uh, sides uh, to give back some objects of uh, art which had been robbed uh, from the countries of their uh, origin. Thank you very much. We'll be talking to Hannah for your questions and comments, and now I'm going to open. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, we know each other coming from online meetings and conferences, so nice to see you here. And uh, thank you for this uh, question about what I call Polish uh, colonial com the complex uh, that is actually inspired by the discussion of uh, Polish and not only, but mostly Polish historians about uh, the Polish colonial uh, uh, colonial past. I always feel that I am in a perhaps more comfortable situation than historians uh, because they discuss, it's really a heated debate, and they discuss about the past that is already gone and interpretations and the museums actually in the, in the very center of the city and we can go there together and take a look and just confront what I say uh, with, uh, uh, with the museum that is very present and physical. So uh, that is uh, a, a bit different. Um, attitude, but of course, I was very inspired by uh, the debate um, that it started in early 2000s. Uh, yeah, so it's like almost 20 years of this heated debate in the field of uh, of uh, history. And of course, I know uh, the book by Jan Sava, Phantomowe Ciaukula, uh, uh, The Phantom Body of the King, uh, would be perhaps the uh, translation that was strongly criticized. He's uh, um, quite young, I would say, the young generation of sociologists, not historians, but he's writing about uh, the past, about the history, and I feel that he was really strongly uh, criticized, but this book was really opening new perspectives and new field for research. And uh, also when I am thinking about this Polish uh, colonial uh, complex, I think about um, all these different periods in uh, the history that are researched now really uh, quite uh, extensively and uh, this difficult position like having these ambitions to have this museum even though we are <laughs> living in a peripheral city of the Russian Empire and uh, uh, the Russian authorities are in favor of creating such a museum because it is not related with the Polish identity and Polish history. It's about ethnography, it's about Asia and Africa. So why do not allow them to have such a museum? And it's also interesting in case of national, the art museum, the National Art Museum in Warsaw, because it was the same situation. As long as you do not collect the Polish art in this museum, you can have a museum it's also uh, this uh, civilizing mission of, uh, of uh, the empire, the Russian empire in that case. So that's um, uh, that's very interesting situation, uh, being colonized and at the same time still trying to have uh, this colonial collection, uh, colonial uh, past and maybe even some small colonies. Of course, when I was uh, uh, quoting uh, Jankowski, it is a kind of myth. I'm not sure if <laughs> if they managed to do uh, anything, but uh, still, this memoir to me is a proof that there was a strong attempt, a strong ambition, and even a dream to have a refuge, to have a substitute of of uh, this uh, uh, Polish country. So. Of course, um, there was a very strong inferiority complex 
um, uh, towards the Western countries, Germany mostly, but not only, and aspiration very strong, like the Polish ethnography was really rooted in the uh, German and the British was also very important. Uh, they were uh, traveling to Oxford to, to learn more. So it was really a strong attempt to have this Western paradigm in, uh, in the field of research and science, but also in institutions like museums, universities, so this double position and also what to do with this inferiority complex, you can transfer it to um, other ethnic and social uh, uh, social groups. So this is what I uh, what I learned mostly from uh, uh, from uh, from historians. And you are shocked when you hear about Leopold Janikowski at the entrance as this father figure for this museum. And yeah, to me it's very, as I said, very again complex figure and example you can explain uh, almost uh, almost everything it's also uh, a fake history the objects are not from his collection but there is still uh, even nowadays a strong attempt to repeat uh, this pattern to repeat this um, this example of traveler who will bring the objects in ethic way because we have good relations with african people uh, we were never as bad as other Western people were. It, and it's also a way to uh, somehow um, work through this uh, inferiority complex when you compare uh, good Polish travelers with uh, the bad others. <laughs> so that that's also a part of the story of Janikowski and Korabiewicz. I read his letters. He was... Uh, uh, expelled from Panganica, and uh, he was just bringing objects illegally, and it was in 1950s, so after the war. So still an attempt to compensate uh, uh, these war losses by, uh, uh, by the cost of uh, those who are in... Uh, um, yes, it's all about this unequal uh, power balance, that's it. Uh, but also they were compensated, something I've forgotten to say uh, before, uh, very coordinated and well-planned actions of transferring objects from the Western uh, territories uh, to Warsaw. It was really mm -hmm. well-organized. Uh, uh, Lawrence was going to a lower Silesia, but then uh, uh, it was all coordinated by local authorities and also on the level of uh, the Polish government because uh, the border was not established yet. Mm -hmm. So the sooner you will pay what can be taken <laughs> from there. And now, um, um, uh, different communities from Laurel Silesia are asking actually national museum in Warsaw to restitute some objects to the uh, churches, monasteries in, in Lower Silesia. So when we think about restitution, that was also your point, it's very complicated. So um, yeah, the Lower Silesia is asking about medieval objects in the uh, National Museum in Warsaw and Ethnographic Museum in uh, Poznan. Poznan is asking uh, for the objects from uh, the National Ethnographic Museum. So like we have this internal European colonization, we have in Poland internal uh, Polish restitution <laughs> issue, I would say. Um, and uh, of course, Posen was uh, not in these recovered territories, but because there was a decree that was saying that uh, the art museum, the national museum in Warsaw, is uh, the main museum for the Poland, a treasury, because everything was taken there. It was the same uh, in case of ethnographic museum. The national ethnographic museum in Warsaw uh, received the status of the main ethnographic museum. And also, Poznan lost some objects. The museum in Poznan was just uh, the storage rooms were emptied from uh, uh, many uh, many important objects. So we have also this internal process of restitution. Uh, but yeah, of course, uh, when I speak about colonization, the problem of restitution always uh, appear, and uh, I know it's uh, it's an important one. Um, but I always repeat that restitution is important, but uh, the epistemic decolonization, the colonization of our knowledge of uh, 
uh, of our ways of thinking, of educational processes, uh, it's uh, of the same importance, I would say. I don't want to say what is more important, because it would be a justice. I'm not in position to judge what is more important, but we uh, we shouldn't think that when the Benin bronzes from the Ethnographic Museum, at least the ones who were produced in the Benin Kingdom, because there is no doubt that they cannot be uh, acquired legally, so um, they should be restituted, but it doesn't mean that the museum will be decolonized. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes really much more um, when we think about this museum, but also other museums. It's very complicated and, of course, political uh, issue. And uh, we speak mostly about uh, Benin bronzes, but not always the communities are asking for their restitutions. We must remember this is not always the case. And there are also different dimensions of um, uh, of ethic problems or issues. So the Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw, because you were asking about the hopes for the colonial practices or processes, uh, actually has started recently one uh, restitution process. Uh, that is uh, connected to human remains in the collection. It's always the most fragile uh, problem, the most fragile issue. It's um, an attempt of the director to return uh, Mokomokai to New Zealand. So, um, but the decision is, of course, on the level of the government. Uh, so the director can only try uh, to restitute the object, but the decision is. Um, uh, is not, of course, uh, made by uh, by him. So um, I would agree that if we have, uh, if we want to have a serious debate, we need to have both sides at the table. And in Humboldt Forum, they actually show uh, this virtual uh, table and the discussion between uh, all sides uh, engaged um, in uh, in this process. Um, so I would say that you know, uh, in the Ethnographic Museum, this way of thinking has just started when the ambassador of New Zealand was invited uh, to for the conversation about Mokomokai and possible restitution, and uh, the process that uh, uh, that actually the ambassador can start asking for the uh, for the uh, for the restitution. So this is something that has I would say just started in uh, in Polish Museum thinking about uh, this very political and criticized acts, but uh, when we think about human remains, I expect that uh, it will be less controversial than uh, Benny bronzes that were acquired uh, in 2017 with the grant uh, from the donation from the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage in Poland, which makes this situation uh, very, of course, uh, delicate and, and complicated. And uh, my approach to politicization of uh, museums nowadays living in Poland, <laughs> when I think about um, uh, the current uh, political situation, uh, well, any project uh, about the colonization um, is somehow endangered because the official narrative about the history puts uh, or presents Poland as eternal victim of neighboring empires and uh, on uh, the political level nobody would like to hear the other side uh, of the story of the ambitions and aggressions there is still very active uh, uh, myth or sentiment toward so-called um, eastern borderlands uh, so western ukraine for example uh, even though this the attitude of the Polish society slightly changed after the Russian uh, aggression. So I would say that something has changed, but more on uh, the level of uh, the, the discussion, um, uh, the social debate, than on the political uh, level. That's my at least uh, uh, at least impression. So museums always. Um, uh, uh, have been and are and will be in the future uh, highly political uh, institutions, especially engaging uh, now into these decolonial debates and uh, and uh, and practices. So this is something that we always just have to take 
uh, into account. And one example from uh, um, uh, from the book, um, uh, this guide for uh, practitioners, but also wider audience. Um, uh, one of these uh, uh, examples, the uh, museum in Dakar that was um, founded with uh, Chinese money <laughs> was the example that I really wanted to involve <laughs> because, of course, I had a doubt if it's a good example of decolonial practices when you think about uh, the contemporary rivalization of uh, modern um, not only uh, states, but also um, uh, uh, corporations. But uh, then I thought that I should involve these examples to show that the situation may be more complicated and less optimistic than it seems. Uh, so that would be my response to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, so I think we are about to finish today's uh, seminar. This was really a very exciting talk. So thank you, Magdalena, for your great paper. Thank you, of course, Magdalena, for your excellent comment. It was really uh, very interesting to have this kind of comparative perspective, also seeing the differences of the dynamics when it comes to decolonization in, for example, Berlin and Humboldt Forum and comparing with technological Museum and also I really like the point you mentioned that decolonization means also the method of decolonization, and this is not only about restitution of objects, so this is a complex and very mainful process. Uh, so there's a lot to be done. And yes, and um, thank you for today. And um, I would like to still make a little announcement uh, as uh, we are having Hanna Rudik, Dr. Hanna Rudik with us, who's also um, giving great comment, by the way. Thank you for all your comments and questions. Thank you, Igor, also to your 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 question and, and bringing also yeah, from Sova, Jan Sova's book. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that uh, we would like to invite you to the next seminar and this series of Klaus Zimmer Colloquium, which will also take place here live, but we will have also the transmission online. So for you, Magdalena, there will be a difficulty to join online. And uh, Hannah Ludwig will talk on uh, the Museum of Varvara and Balkan uh, in Kiev. She will um, also enlighten this museum, as I suppose, in a post colonial perspective. Am I right? Yes. We will still have to somehow think uh, of the concept and, and uh, the, the, the content of, of our seminar. Also, probably will refer to the current situation in China when it comes to museums and, and uh, cultural heritage, protection of, of the cultural heritage in Ukraine. So very current uh, and up-to-date topics. So you are most welcome to join us. Uh, also online or, or of course in person, you're most welcome to come to Berlin if you are not disappointed with today's <laughs> travel to Berlin as, as Magdalena faced some, some problems with, with coming to Berlin, but fortunately she made it and I think it's, it, 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 it's really great you made it, we really enjoyed it, so thank you again for, uh, to you Magdalena, to you Margarita, thank you and goodbye and have a nice summer break and see you in September, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.